Welcome, everybody, to uh, the 2020 Afghanistan Week. My name is Christian berg Harpwicken. I will be moderating this first panel. I'm otherwise a research professor at uh, PRIO, the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. And we inaugurated this year's Afghanistan Week with uh, addressing the most pressing issue of all, the unfolding peace process. The title for today's event is A Close-Up of the Peace Process. We have a very distinguished panel. Uh, we have uh, introductions by Mujib Mashal, who is the uh, incoming South Asia correspondent for the New York Times. We have an introduction by uh, Kai Ada, who is the former UN Special Representative for Afghanistan, former diplomat, writer, and commentator. We have a comment by uh, Yasser Gulami, who is a political scientist based in Oslo. And we have a comment by Turun Wimpelmann, who is a researcher, a senior researcher at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in uh, Bergen. The uh, Afghanistan Week, by now an institution, is a collaboration that is organized by the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, the Christian Mikkelsen Institute, the Peace Research Institute Oslo, and the Nansen Center for Peace and Dialogue. We are also grateful for and would not have been able to do this without the support of uh, NURA, the Norwegian Development Agency, FRITOR, and the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. We are soon entering into the first introduction, but first I want to give you a couple of practical pieces of information. We are now going to uh, listen to introductions and debate amongst the panelists until uh, just short of an hour from now, then we have a very short intermission where you can stretch your legs and uh, fetch a coffee or a cup of tea if those are within reach. If you wish to ask questions in the half hour that follows the intermission, you can do that in the comment field on uh, YouTube. The only thing that you need to do to be able to do so is to log in with a Gmail account. Feel free also to like the movie. We have a welcoming statement by uh, the ambassador to Norway, Ambassador Gafur Sai. And do remember to sign up for the channel if you want to see more of our seminars and uh, films. Uh, we are going to send seminars throughout the week, so uh, do examine the program. With no further ado, we'll now give the floor to the first uh, speaker, who is Mujib Mashal, speaking to us uh, from uh, where he is early morning in New York. We're very happy to have you with us, Mujib. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I will try to stay awake through this because this is very early in the morning here. Um, took a little cold shower. Hopefully that will help. We'll see. Um, so I spent, um, I spent uh, about I was just trying to calculate how long I spent covering the peace process up close in Doha. Um, and, and I figured out that over two years from the early days of the U.S. Taliban talks until the most recent session uh, between the Afghan government and the Taliban, I, I spent a total of about 10 weeks in Doha, uh, which is a long time in a place like Doha. Um, particularly with the COVID reality. Um, and so so I, I, I was very involved in intimately following the process from the beginning. Uh, the current process started about two years ago. And if we remember, it didn't start because of the reality on the ground. It started because of a disruptor. Um, Donald Trump looked at the situation and said the status quo had to change. Uh, the reality on the ground was that um, it was a stalemate, a bloody stalemate. Um, a lot of people were dying on a daily basis, but we weren't reaching uh, a political solution any closer. All sides were kind of openly talking about the fact that this war couldn't be won militarily, but it wasn't really getting people closer to a uh, peace process. And because of one reason, uh, and the reason was that the Taliban uh, had stubbornly uh, stuck to one demand, which was we want to resolve our issue with the U.S. first before we move to negotiations uh, with the Afghan government. Um, I mean, Kai will probably talk about this, but uh, nearly a decade ago, uh, there was a semblance of a process. There were negotiations and there were back channel talks and 
um, a few meetings and got close to starting a formal process. And in that process, there was, uh, there was a possibility that the Americans and the Taliban would start their conversation, but soon it will include the Afghan government also uh, to avoid the risk of the Afghan government being delegitimized by this process. But that didn't happen. And for a decade after that, the war continued and, and the Taliban grew more and more stubborn in their demand that they will only talk to the Americans first, to what they say, to end the occupation, to end the military presence before turning to the internal issues. So the difference uh, that was made two years ago was that Donald Trump and the Trump administration gave in to that demand of the Taliban, saying, we will sit down directly from you. Uh, not only did they sit down directly from the Taliban, but they gave them a deal also. And that deal um, has several elements. Uh, the most important element being that it started uh, the withdrawal of the American and NATO troops, um, that it called for the release of uh, the language of the deal said up to 5,000 Taliban prisoners. But the Taliban showed again that they're stubborn, that they, they read the agreement to the letter uh, and they demanded the exact release of 5,000 uh, prisoners. Um, and then it, the other part of the deal was the Taliban would sit down uh, with a with a delegation representing the Afghan Republic, uh, meaning the government and other uh, uh, players, the opposition players, civil society, and all that. So, so the the deal that the U.S. struck kind of started a process. What we have to remember is that it is a heavily criticized deal uh, because the, those two years where the United States negotiated with the Taliban the Afghan government wasn't part of the process. The Taliban refused to include them and, and, and feeling left out, tensions kept growing between Kabul and Washington. Uh, the, the paranoia in Kabul was that the US was basically betraying its, its partners in Afghanistan, the government that it had funded for 20 years, the government that it was so dependent on US aid, on the US military, on US airstrikes, uh, here was the U.S. sitting across the insurgents, not only legitimizing them and, uh, and giving them a platform, but also basically cutting a deal that just wasn't fair uh, to, to the Kabul, to the Afghan government. So once the deal was struck in February uh, 2020, uh, despite the disagreements, despite the concerns of the Afghan government, uh, it created a space where the Taliban all of a sudden felt very emboldened. Uh, not only because of the legitimacy they saw in two years of negotiations under the media spotlight as kind of projecting themselves as equals to this power that had invaded and this, pow this power that had almost crushed the Taliban. In a matter of a couple of weeks in 2001, 20 years later, they were sitting across from from, from the Americans as negotiating as equals. And, and, and some of the players representing the Taliban in these negotiations were people who had spent more than a decade in Guantanamo and the American detention center. So they just, the, the symbolism of these people who were detainees for a long time now sitting as equals in a negotiating process where they weren't desperate, the Americans were desperate because the, 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 the way the negotiations worked out was that the Americans were actually the more accommodating party in the talks. Every time the Taliban would put their foot down on an issue during those two years of talks, the Americans would say, well, we hear you, we understand what you're saying, let me try to explain to you why what you're demanding will not work. So they will bring out their experts to say how the American troops can't leave in nine months or six months. Logistically, it was impossible. So every time there was, a, there was an issue of contention, the Americans were accommodating rather than demanding. And so once the Taliban got a deal in those kind of circumstances, they were running on such a high of, of a sense of victory where, and, 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 and to, to, to explain why the Americans were, were doing that is to basically say one name, Donald Trump. 
the American negotiators were undercut from the beginning by a president who, and we know this from the Bolton book now, we know this from all the reporting, that Trump wanted out. That whether a deal or no deal, he wanted out. So the negotiators were trying to slow down a crisis and a collapse in Afghanistan by starting a process. It was an ideal process. It was a flawed process, but the, the, the clock was ticking on the worst alternative, which was an abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan, because that is what Trump wanted. That they felt that even a flawed process would buy time, that if they can show the American president that, that, that we're making progress in negotiations, uh, the troops will finally leave, it will calm him down a little bit, and that will give some time to Afghanistan to figure out its, its domestic issues, but also to, to become part of the process where the Afghan government can, um, can you know, express some of its concerns and to correct some of, the, some of the issues that they saw as flawed in the deal. The problem is that the Taliban came out of that deal hugely emboldened. Uh, they start in their propaganda. They started using language of victory, that we have defeated uh, the, the the largest military coalition in the world. So uh, victory is ours. We're entitled to rule Afghanistan. We're entitled to get back what we had, what was taken from us. They see themselves as a government that was toppled unfairly. So the Taliban going into the negotiations with the Afghan government came with the sense of arrogance and with a sense of overconfidence. The Afghan government, deeply troubled by its own inner divisions, if we remember right before the start of the talks, there was an election in Afghanistan, as uh, the history of elections in the country, it, it was flawed again, it was claims of fraud, to a point where we had two presidents sworn in on the same day, so if you are that republic from that reality coming to sit across from the Taliban, you haven't really helped your own hand either. You're showing that you're deeply divided. You're showing that internally you're not on the same page. So it was that republic divided to a point where we had two presidents sworn in on the same day that came across the table from a Taliban that there was a lot of talk about divisions within the Taliban, and there are the, those divisions. But what the Taliban have done, they have two advantages. One is they're a shadowy movement, and not everything that they do is out in the open. Whereas the other side is a democratic republic, so they fight everything on television shows, and all the divisions are out in the open. So the Taliban maintained a sense of or a pretense of unity throughout the process. They came across the table as a united force. They had internal issues till the end, but compared to the open divisions of the Afghan Republic, they seemed united. On the other side, this Republic came uh, across the table that was undermined by its allies. The US literally put a ticking clock and said, we're leaving already, you figure this out. So it didn't really give the Republic any space to fight for the rights, to fight for a fair uh, uh, political formula for the future. It was undermined from within and from outside factors. So once the two Afghan sides, the Taliban and the Afghan Republic sat down, there was a lot of expectation. Um, in that first meeting, there were world leaders, U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo came. Uh, there were statements from the, U the U.N. Uh, Secretary General, from about 20 foreign ministers from around the world. This was the moment. And the expectation from the way the peace process was designed by, by, by the U.S. Uh, uh, Special Envoy was that once we get to this moment, the momentum of the process will, will keep the attention focused and both sides will feel obligated to figure something out. The problem is that between the time that the US deal was struck and be between the time that the two Afghan sides sat at the table, not only the measures that were meant to build trust actually eroded trust. So one measure was the prisoner release. 
the prisoner release was supposed to be a trust building measure that the Afghan government would release 5,000 Taliban and the Taliban would release 1,000 of the Afghan uh, forces. And this would be, this would build goodwill. And once they come to the table, they can, they can use that trust. That issue became so complicated and so divisive that it actually eroded trust. So when the two sides sat down at the table, they were they were even more distrusting of each other than than uh, than a, a than a process that had built trust. So to 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 come to just the current uh, state of things quickly, um, the two sides came to the table. Expectations went up, uh, both in Afghanistan and across the world. That here is the moment we've been waiting for for twenty years. This moment will deliver now. Uh, right away, we faced complications one of the biggest complications was the high expectations. Everybody thought that the first meeting, there'll be a ceasefire uh, or at least a reduction in violence. But for, for more than a month now, almost two months, I've kind of lost track right now, but almost two months, they are stuck on basic issues of rules and regulations that will govern their negotiations. So basically housekeeping issues, but also more fundamental things. There are two things that they have struggled right away to resolve in the rules and regulations for the negotiations before they could get to actual issue of ceasefire and you know uh, political power sharing, things like that. One was a basic issue about the different um, schools of thought within Islam, that if, if the two sides faced a disagreement over an issue, they one school of thought within Islam should be agreed as a dispute resolution mechanism. They struggled over that because the Taliban were pushing for a Sunni school of thought. The Afghan government are saying, well, we have worked really hard to build an inclusive republic where the Shias and other minorities feel included. They, they resolved that. They, they eventually got to a language that both sides agreed on the same school of thought. But the language was such that it felt others feel inclusive, included. So that issue is one that was resolved. But the more fundamental issue that remains, and this is, and I'll end on this, is the Taliban insist that in the framework for the negotiations between the two Afghan sides, the agreement between the Taliban and the US should be declared as the basis of any future negotiation. The Afghan government sees that as a tricky thing that will further undermine it. Because that agreement is basically what has given the Taliban the sense of victory. That agreement was something that the Afghan government didn't play any role in. So to agree to a agreement between the insurgents and the US government as the basis for future negotiations uh, the Afghan government feels that it will undermine them unless they include that the U.S. Taliban agreement and a simultaneous declaration that was issued in Kabul between the U.S. and the Afghan government, or something broader that is not that specific. And and, and on the on the on the surface of it, on the face of it, it might seem like a small issue, but what has scared some of the Afghan negotiators is the tone and is the posturing of the Taliban, where in these negotiations, basically the Taliban are saying, we are sitting down with you, other Afghans, only because we sign with the Americans. And it's a, it's a commitment we have in that deal, but we don't see you any more than say the Nepalese Gurkhas or the contractors who are sort of, who are, you know, contracted by the American and the NATO military presence. And that has scared the Afghan government negotiators that we need, that they're saying we need to do things. We need to put our foot down so the Taliban accept us as equals rather than seeing us as a puppet of, as a byproduct of the American occupation. So that's where the issue has been stuck for two months. I'll leave it at that. It, it seems like a small issue when we say rules and regulations, but it's something more fundamental. It will set the tone for what dynamic the two sides will negotiate uh, uh, going forward. 
So the, the process has been stuck on that issue right now for about a couple of months now. Thank you so much, uh, Mujib, for an uh, eloquent introduction. Uh, very much what we had hoped for. You've already made my day. But we, um, we have more in store. Uh, Kai Mujib argues that uh, this is, a, uh, in fact, a process where the uh, legitimate Afghan government is fighting to even be seen by Taliban and its partners as an equal party in the talks. You have a long history going back to when you served in the Norwegian government in 2006, 2007, following Afghanistan, then as a UN special representative, having taken uh, multiple initiatives to get talks underway. So we're eager to hear how you see the process. I know you're following it also pretty much from day to day. And uh, of course, being situated in, in Oslo, we know that one of the state leaders uh, or diplomats present at the signing ceremony that Mujib referred to in late February was Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. So what stake does Norway have in this and what role may Norway potentially have uh, going forward? Kai, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Um, you asked me to talk about uh, the past, in fact, but um, now you are <clears throat> and you asked me to talk about the future and uh, I will try to do a little bit of both perhaps. First, uh, very pleased to be here. Pleased to see you, pleased to see Mujib again. Uh, it's been some time. Uh, but you say, um, what? let me start with that. What kind of role does Norway have here? Um, uh, as you know, um, the Norwegian foreign ministry started already in 2006, 2006, 7, to uh, contact uh, the Taliban, then in, then in uh, Pakistan mainly. Uh, and I think it was a pioneering uh, activity at the time. Uh, nobody else had had that kind of talks and uh, they became rather frequent. Um, then in, already in 2007, I remember the first Taliban delegation came in great secrecy to, to Oslo. Uh, there were some talks there that uh, worked out and that were uh, quite uh, fruitful, I must say. And then there were some that were aborted. I remember at one stage where two delegations were here in Norway and the meetings never happened because uh, of uh, an attack um, that took place exactly as they landed that touched on the family of one of the participants. So it was, it was very difficult, but it nevertheless became a relationship of trust at the time. And, and we felt um, at that stage that the Taliban didn't really know where to go, uh, what should their thinking around the peace process be. Um, uh, we, we, at one stage, even I remember we, we asked them if they wanted us to write a roadmap. It was then, uh, that must have been just before uh, I left for, for uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I think that would have been useful. Uh, uh, it never got underway. Uh, but we sensed that there was at least interest in keeping touch with us and, and in pursuing a uh, political process. Uh, then I came to, uh, to um, Kabul and Norwegian, the Norwegian channel continued. I was not then part of that, of course, but to try to initiate our own uh, UN channel at the time. Uh, and with some success, I would say with some success, I underline some, we managed to establish a, a, a rather regular, although not frequent dialogue until, as you would remember, early 2010, uh, Mullah Barader was, was put in house, taken into house arrest by the Pakistanis. Uh, during a couple of months before he was taken into house arrest, we really felt that there was a momentum uh, and um, that he was the man behind it. There were all signals that he was the man. Uh, and then what happened was almost the moment when he was taken out of house arrest, um, all channels closed down. There was no way of even getting in touch with any of the interlocutors that we'd had before. Uh, then it lapsed into a void for, for a while and uh, 
Uh, I left Kabul. Um, it was picked up when the office in uh, Doha was finally established and Tayyip Aga was in the head of that office. Um, but let me say, during my time in, in Kabul, and I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this, we tried regularly with the, the, uh, the big powers visiting i remember i remember the um, the um, capitalists on my introductory visits raising the question of political dialogue and the russians were strongly against russians were strongly against the others were not interested but it's interesting to look back now and see that 10, 10 years ago there was absolutely no way that foreign minister lavrov would agree to any political dialogue with the Taliban. That has certainly changed around. Um, and then, you know, at that time, it was really the military logic that dominated the whole, the whole thing. And, okay, and uh, it was impossible to get into, although gradually there was a, lip, there was a lot of lip service played, paid to a political process. There was no, no takers really. And when I raised it in the Security Council in late 2008, I think nobody even cared to comment on this rather radical uh, position as it was seen to be at the time. Uh, and, and that logic, of course, was proven so dramatically when we had the surge in 2010 and 11. And I remember the discussions on that. And there was, a, there was a defense minister meeting just to illustrate the atmosphere within the NATO alliance at the time. There was McChrystal, a very charismatic general, coming and launching the surge and the plan that he uh, had approved, uh, had uh, obtained approval for in, in, in uh, Washington. And there was such a atmosphere around the table of ministers. Uh, one defense minister said, now we finally have a strategy. We know where to go. We know that we can win. Thank you, General, for giving us finally something to believe in. Hmm? And I was sitting there uh, as a UN uh, representative and I was given the floor. And I said, uh, uh, listen with interest to the debate, don't believe it's as easy as it may seem uh, from the discussions around the table. And the Canadian defense minister whom I knew very well came over to me after the meeting and said, oh, it was such a good atmosphere. Why did you have to ruin that? Um, that, that, but that was a feeling at the time, you know, that we could still win, we could still win in spite of the fact that from 2008 and onwards, there was an escalation of Taliban activity. We still believe that we could, could win. And I do believe in fact that, and, and I have evidence on that, but I will not mention any names. The sad thing is of course that in Kabul, you still feel, you still find political actors at the high level, high level, that believe it's possible to win militarily. Uh, and I must say, if you haven't learned by now, then there's a chance that you will not learn at all, of course. Uh, I remember the, 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 the clear build, clear hold build strategy that McChrystal launched in 2010. Um, it was, and with 140,000 international forces, there was no clear signs that we could could win this uh, this uh, on, the, on the military battlefield. Not only because we lacked the knowledge of of the lands of the of the, the country, we, the landscape, etc., what kind of terrain we were operating in, but also that much too little had been devoted to doing uh, what uh, should have been done, and that is a balanced approach between the political and military, where a political dialogue, of course, has to be at the center of, of your wider strategy. That, unfortunately, did not happen, and we are where we are today. Um, um, I think the lessons are, you know, you can never start early enough to explore the possibilities for a political dialogue. Um, and uh, engaging in a protracted military campaign in such different and difficult circumstances uh, will, will 
seldom lead to success. And if it doesn't lead to success after 10 years on the ground, the public uh, will become frustrated and alienated from what you're doing. And we saw that with the increase in civilian casualties and so on, how the Afghan people gradually also stopped believing in what the international community uh, could uh, could actually do. Now, on the on the Taliban side, you know, what have I seen in course of, uh, over the years? Um, first, of course, only attempts to talk about talks. There was very little substance at that time. Then, when the office was established in Doha with Taya Baga and the circle around him, a feeling that there was a development on the Tal Taliban side, that they were, in fact, not only interested in discussing with the US, but also with, as I said, all elements of the Afghan political establishment, including the government. And I remember when we got that message uh, from, from, uh, from the Doha office, I rushed myself to, to cover, to deliver that message to President Karzai. But such was the doubt among the people around him that uh, I was not even given uh, the opportunity to meet the president. And uh, when I, my possibilities for meeting him were over and I was at the airport, somebody called me from the uh, president's entourage and say, Kaya, have you been here in Kabul today? We hear rumors now that you're here, but I was never in fact, I said I, I, I was, I was uh, going to deliver you a message from, from Doha, but I was never given the possibility to do so. And I told them who had the message and what happened afterwards, I don't know. But it illustrates one thing that is, there was never on the Afghan side during Karzai or during Arsh Afghanistan, a clear readiness from the from the government to enter into into a, a, a the real discussion, and it still does not exist. It still does not exist, which also gives Taliban doubt about whether it would be possible to to proceed or not. You know, and when you look at the statements from the first vice president Amrullah Saleh. Uh, you can understand that they are in doubt uh, and what I hear from him reflects what I also thought at the time. Um, uh, on the Taliban side, uh, as Mujib said, uh, there are disagreements. Uh, is there a disagreement now on the basic line? I don't know. Uh, but I've seen, I noticed over the last year and a half, uh, how there has been disagreement between the political office and the military on the ground. For instance, when it comes to how to treat the World Health Organization, the Swedish Afghanistan Committee, and so on. You know, there are differences. Um, will the Taliban budge from their present position? I don't think so. Um, I think they feel that over the last uh, months of, uh, uh, over the last long period now of discussions, they have basically got what they want so far uh, through the, the discussions with, with the, the Trump administration. They have been recognized in a way. They have an agreement with the Americans that is rather favorable. Uh, and I feel, think that they, are, they feel that they are both politically and militarily on the offensive. It's going to be very hard to turn them away from that. Uh, I think what is certainly needed is uh, some kind of concession from both sides that demonstrates that both sides are committed to the peace process. Today, there's a doubt whether anybody is, and that certainly uh, does not promise much for, for the future. Then comes the question of what will the Biden administration eventually think and do about this? Uh, I do not think there will be any major uh, change. Maybe there will be a slight slowdown in the withdrawal of the remaining American troops, uh, but that should, there should be a fundamental change, shift in the administration uh, in a policy that is designed to end the endless wars that I do not think will happen.
what we need is, first of all, I think a, a more united uh, Afghan or carbon negotiation team, um, and that there is a, the, the, the carbon political landscape is seen to support uh, the um, the process. Um, I think also the Americans need to demonstrate that the withdrawal of the remaining forces is indeed condition based, and hopefully that will bring more soberness into the discussions that are now ongoing in Doha. I think I will end there, Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Kai. I uh, jokingly said that you you may be somewhat pessimistic. I don't think you were. Uh, I know you as an eternal optimist, but I do think what you just gave us was a very realistic assessment of where things stand. I'm also very grateful for your historical perspective. I think it's extremely interesting to see uh, both the con continuities and the ruptures in how this has evolved. And I take particular note of uh, you highlighting the fact that the government's reluctance to engage seriously in talks has been with us for the past decade and a, and a half. Now, Kirsten, would you allow me just 30 seconds? 30 seconds max, yes. 30 seconds, yeah. Because you, you asked me about Norway's role as a facilitator. I think Norway has been there all the time. I think what you do not need is a group of facilitators. You need one facilitator. And without being um, illoyal to the Norwegian government, I think the, the uh, facilitator should be somebody who knows not only the terrain, uh, but who knows the, the, the participants in the talks. And I also think that if there would be a, a Muslim facilitator, I think that would be an advantage. If you can buy, combine all these three, I think you have an ideal uh, facilitator. And to me, it seems to be <clears throat> the current facilitator that suits the role best. Thank you. I hope many of you took note of that. There is certainly more to discuss there. Uh, we're now moving over to uh, Ahmed Yasir Gulami, who is uh, going to offer some comments on what we've just heard. And there is a vast menu to choose from, Ahmed. So uh, it's up to you where you want to pick, please. Ahmed, you'll have to switch on your mic. You're um, muted. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I will be, uh, begin. Um, I will begin to thank uh, our panelists for uh, uh, very good uh, uh, introductions. Uh, Mujib gave us a very good um, overview of how the process, peace process started and uh, uh, where did we come, uh, what are achieved, and uh, where are we now, and how Mr. Trump um, put the negotiators in a very difficult positions. So it was very, I, I, I was enjoying uh, listening to him because he has, uh, has had an uh, extraordinary access to the negotiators. We are just following uh, from the media, but it's different to listen to someone uh, like Mujib. So thank you, Mujib. Um, uh, for me, it seems when Mujib uh, was speaking that uh, there are a lot of difficulties ahead, uh, especially for Afghans or for, for uh, uh, Afghan government. Uh, Yesterday, I was uh, I, I tried to take uh, a look at the um, peace agreement between Taliban and the U.S. And my feeling all the way was that the winner here is the Taliban, the, and the tone of the text was so so in in in, 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 in not between a, a movement uh, and a superpower. Uh, so so it uh, and it. I was amazed at um, how uh, the U.S. Um, 
uh, use the, the language about Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is used only uh, as Al Qaeda, not not a terrorist group or uh, ISIS K. Khorasan is not even uh, mentioned in the text. Uh, so uh, I just got a feeling that the, the U.S. Uh, tell the Taliban, "Hey, we'll leave your country, but don't drink tea with the bad guys." I mean, that they say that the Al Qaeda should not use the Afghanistan soil to threaten Af uh, the US or the US interests and its allies, but nothing more. It's, it, it's connected to their action, not in how about, about their presence in Afghanistan. So it's subject to, um, uh, uh, to interpretations. Uh, that's my... Uh, Feeling. So uh, Mujib gave us a, 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 a very detailed, uh, I, I feel, but uh, and I agree very much that um, there are challenges ahead uh, that would be very difficult uh, to uh, uh, resolve. I, I think it was not a good idea to um, uh, to let the ceasefire or to the intra-Afghan um, negotiations. It, it would be wise if the U.S. Uh, used their leverages to uh, reach some settlements with the Taliban that they reached uh, a ceasefire temporary, okay, uh, since the, they got released the uh, 5,000 and so uh, prisoners uh, from detentions. Uh, and uh, Mujib said that uh, uh, the Afghan ne negotiators and Taliban, they have resolved the question of um, a different school of thought in Afghanistan. As far as I uh, know, they haven't. Uh, recently, I, I, I listened to Hafiz Mansour's interview and uh, I just ask uh, Mujib if uh, um, maybe I'm not updated. If, if if they have resolved, so this is very very good news because this is very uh, was very tough question and uh, it uh, it raised many questions about Taliban uh, themselves because first many of us thought that um, the Taliban now is not the Taliban of 1990s. They have changed. But as soon they sat uh, on the table with the Afghan negotiators, we have heard that uh, the, the Taliban start with insisting on um, having the Hanafi school uh, as, a, um, uh, as a as a low school for Afghanistan. So yeah. And. Uh, Regarding to Kai, I think he, is descri he described a very complicated situation. Uh, the peace process involves um, many international actors, uh, Russia, Iran, India, uh, and other major powers, US, and uh, the other, the Afghan government has its weaknesses, as Kai described. Uh, even now, today, they are not talking with a united voice. All this, uh, I agree, that uh, makes them vulnerable. The Taliban will uh, negotiate from a power position, but on the other side, uh, uh, the Afghanistan gov government appears very split, uh, disunited, and weak. So this is not good news for uh, those of us who are appreciating human rights, uh, democracy, right to vote, uh, freedom of speech, uh, uh, and things like that. So uh, I very agree with uh, Kai that it would be wise to for the Afghan government. It's high time to, uh, for them to uh, get more united to solve their differences. Uh, and in, we know the Taliban controls much more uh, territory of the country and 
uh, I'm afraid that the peace process can collapse and the Taliban can overrun cities after another as they have tried in, uh, in later months in Helmand, in Kandahar, and in Ghazni and Kunduz. So uh, my point is, is that, that, that now the, uh, the, the whole situation is very complicated. Uh, and I believe this is thanks to the Mr. Trump's uh, desperation of getting out so quickly as possible from Afghanistan and not considering the achievement of 18 or 19 years uh, uh, works there and not considering uh, what is the situation on the ground and not listening to his own military commanders. So uh, I, I'm more uh, pessimistic this time than, I, than before, than ever before. Yeah, I will end for now here, so. Thank you so much, uh, Yazir. Very, very interesting um, reflections on the basis of the introductions we just heard. We now move over to... Uh, uh, just well, well, uh, one thing, uh, Christian, I forgot to uh, address to... Very, very short, Yazir. Yeah, Mr. Kai, uh, that if, if you could um, touch on upon rules of India and Pakistan, what is uh, at stake for, for example, India. I just w want to mention a little bit that this time there are much to, uh, at stake for India because this time is the situation is different. Uh, in 1990s, it, uh, India had the company of Russia and Iran, but this time Russia and Iran, as Kai uh, hinted, uh, they are okay with the Taliban. So uh, if he can elaborate more on this based on his experience and knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Yasir, for bringing in the regional perspective, a favorite topic of many of ours. And of course, it is conspicuous that this is a peace process that has unfolded without really a regional track in the absence of a functioning format for engaging uh, the neighbors jointly around one, one single table. Uh, I'm sure we can return to that after the break uh, as well, but we're now handing it over to Torun Wimpelman, who is a researcher at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute, will offer also her reflections on the introductions that we heard earlier this morning. Please, Torun. Uh, thank you, Christian. Um, I, I really enjoyed listening to, to the presentations um, uh, by Mujib and Kai and also Yasser. But I, I, I cannot help feel <laughs> very disheartened by them. I think together the two main presentations, you know, they, they were like unfolding of a tragedy. And we hear so many uh, accounts of, um, of key actors having, having made um, mistakes in, in, uh, throughout time, uh, which in, in, the net, in some has, has led us to where we are now. For instance, Kaeda. He spoke about the kind of coin frenzy uh, during the time of McChrystal and all these kind of uh, rock star generals um, that those of us who were in Afghanistan at that time remember very well the atmosphere where it was all about the military and complete unrealistic ideas of what, what they could achieve. Um, and then um, further down, we hear about uh, Trump and how he's been undercutting uh, the peace process uh, for two years. Um, I think another um, spoiler um, that a lot of people um, always see the spoiler um, just a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, was when Ghani pressed ahead for elections. Um, and uh, he was then accused of prioritizing clinging to power uh, and stopping the peace process from getting started. Um, I think where we are now, though, um, from from what I hear, and I haven't heard, had of course the privilege to <clears throat> follow these um, negotiations as as close as um, Mujib and Kai. Um, I think the Taliban is 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 really appearing as um, uh, their their posture. Uh, they're not being particularly helpful when it comes to getting the peace process uh, moving. Um, and I think the, the Afghan government and, and the Afghan people uh, who are not in con Taliban control areas, they find themselves in an incredible difficult situation. Um, I think throughout this, this talk, we had a kind of a binary or an opposition between, you know, a military solution and a peace settlement. 
And I think I'd mentioned at some point that, um, you know, there are still people who cling to this idea that there can be a military solution. And I think um, on that point, I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that I don't think that it's just a choice between a military solution and a peace negotiation, because I think the situation that a lot of urban Afghans find themselves in now is that we're asking them to um, take this massive leap of faith and go all for the peace process um, in the sense that they should support the full withdrawal of um, American forces even before we have that peace settlement. Um, but I don't think it's very difficult for any of us to be 100% certain um, that the um, Taliban will put down the weapons once the Americans are out. Um, for instance, there has been a lot of uh, kind of frightening comments by, by um, the Taliban about continuing the jihad uh, also after the US forces have left uh, until the rule of Islam take hold in our homeland. Um, spokesman Mujahid talked about continuing to killing all troops and uh, workers serving in the Kabul administration as long as they don't accept an Islamic system. So I think um, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, I think a lot of people feel that it's not necessarily a choice between a military uh, solution and a peace process, but it's also, it's more about just um, holding on to some kind of uh, preventing a complete collapse. It's very, very difficult to, to, tr to trust the peace process fully when, when you don't know um, how the other side, if, if they will also then lay down their weapons or what you're really facing is the instability and violence that we have now or an even worse uh, violence that might come. Uh, if there's a full-on civil war. Um, so I think, and I just wanted to share Yassir's encouragement of the, of the Fikh issue. Uh, I also wasn't aware that, um, um, that uh, the Taliban has agreed, uh, or that the parties have agreed to a solution about um, which Islamic laws of school that should be referred to in, uh, if there's a dispute. So um, Ajib, if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit about exactly what kind of agreement um, they have come to on that question. Uh, that would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Turun, for very interesting reflections and for offering uh, a different perspective, which I think represents the worries of, uh, of many Afghans uh, with uh, what is unfolding in Doha at the moment and its uh, possible consequences. Uh, we have only a few minutes left before we have a little intermission, but I think we'll uh, ask Mujib to follow up on the exact question that Torun asked towards the end and that uh, Yazir also brought up, namely, uh, what is the nature of the settlement on the rules of engagement for the talks in Doha when it comes to the uh, application of the Hanafi code of jurisprudence versus a more, uh, a more diverse interpretation of uh, Islam? Uh, I think um, I think the fundamental thing on that to understand is that the current Afghan constitution actually also says Hanafi fiqh as prioritizes Hanafi fiqh, um, but the language is such that it allows the followers of other schools of thought uh, to have the option of. Uh, resorting to the school of thought they follow and family matters in the courts, right? So the disagreement actually wasn't really that big. Both sides share common ground in accepting the Hanafi fiqh as the dominant, the majority school of thought in Afghanistan. The issue was the politics around it. The Taliban were still insisting on an exclusionist sort of language where it would just be Hanafi fiqh and no sort of not throwing others any peace of mind. Uh, whereas the Afghan government wanted more of a, a sort of a civil society democratic language around it. So my understanding is just because that issue took a backseat, the two issues were again, um, the two issues were simultaneously being sorted out. The issue of the, the fiqh, the school of thought, and the issue of, of the U.S. Taliban deal being the basis for the, for the future negotiations. 
my, they haven't declared that they've resolved the, the Hanafi issue yet. But my understanding from conversations with negotiators from both sides is that that became the less problematic, the less complicated of the two issues to sort out because it was a matter of language. Both sides actually agree on Hanafi being. And again, I remind that the current Afghan constitution says Hanafi also. It was just figuring out a language that did not alienate um, the other minorities. So my understanding is that they've actually, by virtue of focusing on this one issue of the US Taliban deal, um, there are signs, but, but these are signs that I've confirmed also with negotiators that they have figured out a language around the Hanafi issue that that is no longer a major sticking point. I wanna, I wanna if I can touch on one more thing and, and sort of Kai mentioned that, uh, that sort of concessions are expected from both sides of this process to move forward. The problem here is that a lot of the concessions on behalf of the Afghan government were already made by the US, right? So prisoners, a major, I mean, one of the main things that the Afghan government has over the Taliban is the prisoners, right? And the US made that concession in a process that the Afghan government wasn't even part of. Here is the problem. I don't think the Afghan government is in a position to make many more concessions because it doesn't really have much left. It is on the Taliban to show that they have received a favorable deal from the Americans, and now they're willing to show the Afghans, other Afghans, that they believe in a compromise. They are not showing that sign right now. On the Afghan government side, the problem is one of mismanagement and one of not really understanding the vulnerabilities of its position. If you are the Afghan government and the US makes a concession on your behalf of 5,000 prisoners, despite your opposition, and then the US forces you to release those 5,000, it is wiser to embrace that and then to use it to gain something out of the Taliban rather than resisting it to show two things to the Taliban. One is that your partner will force on you, that your resistance doesn't matter anything. The other is you prove to the Taliban again that you are a puppet, that if you resist something and you can't follow through with your resistance, instead of using an awful, awful concession that the Americans made on your behalf, but realizing your vulnerability and using that concession that was made because you have no other choice because the Americans were threatening to cut money, threatening to cut aid, threatening to not carry out airstrikes, without realizing the vulnerability of your position to use unfair concessions made on your part as a way of taking ownership of it and building trust with the Taliban rather than further undermining yourself. So, so I just go back to the basic point that concessions from both sides, as Kai said, is a little difficult because a lot of concessions on the Afghan government side has already been made on behalf of the Afghan government by the Americans. It's actually on the Taliban right now to show some compromise as a way of signaling that they're not after a full takeover, but they are actually believe in a political process that will require compromise. Thank you, Mujib, for, uh, for picking up on that and for those interesting reflections. We'll now have a short intermission, five minutes. We will, in other words, reconvene in four minutes and 59 seconds. So time to pick up a coffee or a cup of tea or whatever you want, and then we'll see each other. We are curating questions that are coming in on the YouTube channel as we speak. So we will uh, return now to a set of questions from the audience uh, after the um, intermission. Five minutes from now. Thank you so much so far. Five minutes break. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the YouTube comment field. Log in with the Gmail account and ask your question. And we will start again in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Thank you, very nice to have you all with us, including the uh, panelists. And we have received a number of very interesting questions. I can reveal already now that there is no way in which we're going to be able to pay justice to all. So I'll try to synthesize a little bit uh, across questions. And I think we will start with uh, a question that several of you touched upon uh, and that Torun in particular, Torun in particular dwelled upon in her remarks. And that is the question simply of um, civilian suffering. Uh, we had all hoped that with uh, the signing of the agreement in Doha in February, there would be a reduction in uh, Violence, indeed, that was the term being used. It has been very hard to get the Taliban to agree to the ceasefire that the government has uh, insisted upon. So the question simply is, uh, is there any way in which uh, one can conceivably get to a significant reduction in violence in the current situation? Or is there not? Uh, and what is the reason that the Taliban seem to be so insistent on keeping up the military pressure on the uh, Afghan government? And by extension, why is it that we in fact see such an increase in the, uh, in the civilian casualties as we are seeing uh, at the moment? Indeed, there are some historic parallels here too. Uh, and uh, Kai did uh, dwell upon uh, his battle to, uh, to foster a, a, an informed discussion and a critical scrutiny of civilian casualties more than 10 years back. So I don't expect you all necessarily to comment on this set of questions, but uh, you are free. Uh, and please do keep your comments short because we have a few more questions that we'd like to address as well. Who wants to start out? Um. So on, on, on civilian casualties, absolutely. I think the expectation was that yes, this peace process is gonna be a complicated, uh, long process, uh, but at least the people, uh, you know, in the villages, in the cities, everywhere should feel a slight difference in the risk to their daily lives. Um, the reality is that the opposite has happened. In fact, violence has gone up uh, and there is no hope that, that there's no hope for a ceasefire. I think the expectation of a ceasefire in the early stages was, um, it, it wasn't realistic. The Taliban simply weren't gonna agree to a ceasefire when a lot of the fundamental issues in terms of their future and power uh, remained unclear the only leverage they have is violence. The main leverage that they have is violence. They weren't gonna give that up until they figured out a political formula. But the expectation was to show goodwill for a process, to show that they believe in compromise and to also create space for themselves with a population that they're gonna be rejoining, that they would reduce attacks. The reality is that in the past couple months, since, since the beginning of direct negotiations, attacks have actually gone up. And yes, there is violence from the Afghan government also. Yes, there are airstrikes. Yes, there are commando raids. But the way the violence is structured right now, the initiative is with the Taliban. Because the Afghan government has very openly said, we will agree to a ceasefire. We will initiate a ceasefire. But the fact that the Taliban say no to that and they launch the attacks first, then it creates a cycle where it keeps escalating from the other sides as well. So can we get to a ceasefire or, or a reduction in the kind of violence that average Afghan citizen would feel it? I'm afraid the only leverage in this is the United States. The, the only leverage that can actually bring that about is the United States because of the way the United States has structured this deal. From the beginning, the main player was the United States and the US believing what the Taliban was telling them. There's a lot of gray areas that came out in the public. There were a lot of gray areas of the US Taliban deal about violence reduction. This term has turned into a joke in Afghanistan because it doesn't mean anything, but only the US knew what bars were set for what would be considered a violence reduction. 
So it is on the U.S. to step in and say, this is a violation or this is unacceptable. And the U.S. has been unwilling to do that. And only the U.S. can sort of tell the Taliban that we will stop, we'll pause our withdrawal if you don't stop your attacks. The U.S. is unwilling to do that. So, so this gray area of the deal that the U.S. said was there, that the U.S. said there were agreements, understandings, not agreements, because it wasn't on the paper, it wasn't in the text, but understandings on reducing the levels of violence. Only the U.S. knows what the Taliban had, ag had agreed to. So it is on the U.S. to come forward and put its foot down. And the U.S. has been so desperate to get out that it, it seems like it will accept anything uh, to continue with the withdrawal. So I, to, just, to, just to summarize that point, what can bring about a reduction in violence? I'm afraid the way the deal is structured, only the US putting its foot down can actually bring about a change. That is the main leverage in this process. Thank you, Mujib. And on the, on the, point, of, uh, and, and the point of the US, I wanna ask uh, also, if you look at the structure of negotiations now, we know that both parties insist that this should be a negotiation between Afghan parties. There is no need for a third party mediator. Well, simultaneously, I think we see a situation where effectively the US special envoy, Salmai Khalid Saad, is playing the role of the third party mediator very forcefully. And in the absence of that mediator, there would simply have been no talks. So that brings me to the question about what is it that we should expect moving forward? And uh, Kai, you may want to address this first. Uh, will we see Biden renewing uh, Khalil Saad's mandate, keep him on to keep the talks on track? If not, will he pull out of the, media of the mediations altogether? What, what can we expect to be Biden's take on mediations in particular? I think you all said that we shouldn't expect uh, a total turnaround in U.S. positions overall with the shift from Trump to Biden. Uh, it's, he's probably all too grateful for Trump having, in some sense, pulled him out of the quagmire that Afghanistan represents, as seen from Washington. But what does it mean for the peace process in particular? <clears throat> You, you gave me the, the floor, hmm? yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not wearing glasses because uh, this is what happened yesterday. Uh, so if, if you think that the way I speak uh, reflects a certain dizziness, that's absolutely correct. Uh, but I will try, uh, right there on, on Biden's uh, policy, uh, it remains to be seen of course, I, I, I would believe that he, he will see to it that he has a man of stature to be able to continue being engaged. Uh, if not as Khalilzad has been engaged, then something similar to that. Will it be Khalilzad? Probably doubtful, uh, but it's very hard to find somebody with the same experience. But they, this could also be an opportunity to for a reset when it comes to um, confidence between the US and Kabul. Of course, if a mediator was uh, where to be, was to be uh, appointed, who is not Khalid Zad, that given all the bad blood that exists between between him and some of the Afghan leaders, um, so on that on that side, I believe there'd be continuity, but with a different uh, um, different um, set of personnel. Could I just say a word, uh, Kisan, about the ceasefire? And the, Absolutely. And, the, and, the, and the reduction of violence. Uh, I think what, what you see now um, from the Taliban certainly is going on over book, you know, going over. And um, do they understand that or do they not? I, I don't know. But what is happening is that, of course, they are strengthening the hardliners in, in Kabul, uh, those who are most opposed to uh, the peace process. Secondly, they will affect Biden's thinking and the pressure on Biden from people in the Senate uh, to the effect that you can't leave Afghanistan now. You see what's happening. Huh? The Taliban is not respecting the agreement that we entered into in, a in addition, of course, to all the lives that it costs. So I think, um, uh, you know, I wonder, is it disagreement within the Taliban or is it, does it reflect a belief that if you just continue pressuring, 
we will obtain more concessions as we've done in the past. I think now the, the limit has been reached where they have to make a decision uh, and overcome any disagreement there may, there may be. Uh, and I, I simply don't believe that they, and that's where I'm pessimistic, I don't believe that the uh, process will continue um, without a reduction of violence, a significant reduction of violence. Ceasefire, I never believed that there would be a ceasefire. Uh, and I don't think, uh, I think that would be too heavy to take on board the American Taliban agreement also. Uh, because I think the Taliban would have asked for too much in return for a ceasefire. Uh, I think it was unwise from the government. I think it's unwise from the EU also, by the way, to pressure the way they do for, for a, a ceasefire. Because if the Taliban was to accept that, they would also ask for it much more than would be reasonably acceptable by the by the Kabul uh, government. But a reduction of violence, that is absolutely necessary if these negotiations are going to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mujib. I just, I, I wanted to say that there's, a, there's something fundamental about how Taliban do their fighting and politics in how things are playing out right now. I, my understanding is that Taliban never really, they don't have this national Congress every year where they sit down and they debate issues and they come up with positions that this is what we want in the future of Afghanistan. They, for, for a long time, they're so focused on this one goal to get the foreign military out of Afghanistan mm -hmm. that they haven't really come to fundamental conclusions on other issues. So all of a sudden they found themselves in a moment where they have to reckon with what is gonna be the role of women in the future? What is gonna be role of elections? What is gonna be a structure of power? What do we get in the structure of power? All these issues are debates that are unresolved within the Taliban. The problem is that they have come to negotiations with a mentality where we'll see what we can get right? Not with, this is, here are the positions we've laid out. The Afghan government has laid out positions. You know, we, we want to maintain the republic. We want to maintain democracy. We want to maintain women's rights. And let's talk around. These are our red lines. The Taliban don't really lay out lines. So they come to every meeting with the hope of, let's see what we can get. And in that kind of a mindset, this violence on the ground is difficult to read. Is, is this because of divisions? Or is it because in this, in this outlook of let's see what we can get, that pressure actually helps you? So everybody is on board. Let's keep hitting on the ground until we get what we want at the table. But it's, 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 a, more, it's a more basic fundamental thing about how the Taliban have approached this process that kind of explains a little bit uh, the violence. But I do agree with Kai. I, I think the Taliban have pushed their hand a little too far in a way where they've miscalculated. Maybe, I mean, we've seen their public statements about they hope that Trump would win, right? Uh, and, and that Trump didn't win. And I feel like they've pushed their hand a little too far where there will be certain pressures on Biden to, to reset this process in a way that will do away with a bit of the advantage that was given to the Taliban. On Khalilzad, uh, I agree again with Kai that there's a lot of bad blood between him and Ghani in particular. They haven't seen eye to eye and they have a long history that it goes you know, before this peace process. But he also brings a certain set of skills and sort of tools that are unique to him. It, it depends on how he uses those tools. I think the the line for how he uses those tools are set by his bosses in Washington. And the lines that were set for him in this process were was pretty bad. So he was using a lot of uncertainty, a lot of personal skills to keep a process together where the expectation was unrealistic, right? So it could be an opportunity where he uses the same tools with a little more leverage and a little more space. But 
speaking from Kabul's perspective, it's very clear that Kabul would like to see a change of who leads this process. The Taliban have liked him a lot because he's basically given them the deal that they like. So, so it'll be, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be interesting what happens, but I want to reiterate that I feel the Taliban have pushed their hand a little too far where they may create a kind of reflection and a kind of pressure around this process that will do away with certain advantages that they have had so far. Thank you. That's a very interesting perspective. And I, I do take note that it differs from a perspective offered by a number of other well-informed analysts who would uh, argue as we speak that the Taliban has been very smart in not committing to red lines, but actually keeping their positions open. I think that brings us to a question which has been raised also by um, people in the audience, which is, is there really any reason to expect that the Taliban, as we see them now, are committed to a peace process with an end result, or are they simply playing a waiting game? Uh, is this, have they already capitalized what they can capitalize on the process? And now they're actually moving toward something very different than a, a peace agreement, which I don't see as very likely. And perhaps to look at the mirror image of uh, all this, uh, the, the Afghan government side, uh, we talked a lot about it, uh, but we talked about it mainly as a coherent actor. What are the main internal divisions within the uh, government delegation? We've recently seen even parts of the Afghan sort of government support base reaching out to the Taliban and insisting on independent negotiations, which seem to be uh, really uh, rocking the base of the whole uh, Doha process. So what are the main issues of contention? I know this is the subject of a new seminar. We don't have time for that. But if you could outline one or two of you, just the very key issues uh, um, on the government side that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, divides between different factions. Uh, I think Again, there are two, we need to distinguish between two things. One is the power side of the politics, right? The share of powers. One is the value side of the politics in the current system. On the power side of the politics, a lot of the key actors already have direct channels to the Taliban because they don't believe in Ashraf Ghani. And President Ghani has struggled to create that kind of consensus by bringing in uh, under one tent, all these major players. So these players are hedging their bets. They're opening channels to the Taliban. So politically speaking, yes, it is a divided Kabul because Ghani can't rally them. Uh, but in terms of values, and I think here again is where the Taliban might be miscalculating. In terms of values, a lot of these players who are reaching out directly to the Taliban on a, on the, on the, in a conversation about share of power, they are united with Ghani on the basics of the values of the current system, which is, you know, voting and elections, uh, freedom of speech, uh, women's rights, right? So that's where I think it's a little tricky and, and the Taliban need to distinguish that if a Mohakik or an Atta or any other player or Dostum reaches out to talk directly, that doesn't mean they'll be able to accept any vision of the Taliban for the future, right? They may, these sort of side deals will further undermine Ghani as the individual, as the president of Afghanistan, but it won't necessarily help the Taliban get an Islamic emirate in the future, right? So the Taliban needs to show compromise on its former hardline views. Is the Taliban playing a waiting game? It's, it's so difficult to tell because on, on, the, on, the, on the one hand, you've got these players who ex most of their political office, most of their negotiators are gray bearded old figures who have experienced in the 90s how difficult it was to govern when you're heavily sanctioned, right? And they know very well that the world community, the US and the Europeans will tie any money they give to Afghanistan 
to certain basic rights and certain basic values. There's no way that Europe, there's no way that the U.S. can justify giving $4 billion a year to a government that will ban women from going to school and then would ban women from having, you know, close to equal rights. So, so on the one hand, you have a layer of Taliban overseeing this process who in private say, we have experienced what it looked like trying to do it on our own. And it wasn't easy. On the other hand, those same guys who would suggest that they're not waiting a, a they're not playing a waiting game, they're actually serious about a compromise, they seem to be struggling to get their military side on the same page. And we have to remember from history and from now, it is the field commanders that have mattered in terms of the Taliban in setting the values for governance also. Even under Mullah Omar, it was the field commanders that tied him down in terms of how much he can give because he was always, always sensitive. It was those guys that really kept him as the emir, right? So, so, so in that confusion between what, they, what these old gray bearded leaders who've experienced it all and who know very well that if they push too far, they will return Afghanistan to the 1990s that became the reason for their existence in the first place, right? That anarchy that gave birth to the Taliban. They know very well that if they push too far, we will be more than returning to an emirate, we'll be returning to an anarchy because, and I go back to that basic point that a lot of these political players might be reaching out directly to the Taliban on shares of power, but there's no way that they will agree to a Taliban emirate. So if the Taliban keep pushing for that, we, the more likely scenario is that we will disintegrate into fiefdoms where it's a free for all and everybody fights their own battles rather than the Taliban taking over. So, and I, one, one, one final point that I, I think Torin asked this question in terms of, we talk about a divided Kabul and a divided Republic coming to the table. One thing, if there's one little sign of thing, hope that I've had in this pessimistic picture is actually this negotiating team that has come to represent the Republic, they have actually put up a pretty united fight on, on the values at the table. They represent sects that don't see eye to eye in Kabul. They are undermined on a daily basis by those divisions in Kabul, but they feel like they need to bring their best game around the table because it is about something bigger than Dostum, than Ghani, than Muhaqif, than, than their patrons, right? So if there's been one sign of hope in this process, and I think the Taliban are noticing that, is that these, divide, these, these negotiators from the Republic side who or representing a very, very divided republic have managed to put up a united face around these basic values. Very interesting. As I'm sure the audience has noted, we're already a few minutes over time. And if you ask me, I could have gone on for the whole uh, evening and throughout the night because this is so interesting. We won't be doing that, but we will give it a few more minutes. We'll go up to 15 minutes over time. It means 10 more minutes. Uh, and I see uh, Kai is eager to speak. Uh, if I may inject, I would be very happy, Kai, if you could respond to one particular question that we have received from Hasina Shirsad. She is curious about why a Muslim facilitator would be uh, helpful in this particular context. And if I may, uh, this may be a question you'd like to entertain, but perhaps also Mujib or others. I'm curious about one question that's been raised, which is the question as to whether there has really been progress in terms of substance in the Doha uh, talks. Uh, we know there's been lots of talks about the rules for the talks, but we could imagine that there's been quite a bit of discussion about what the agenda should be, what the issues should be, what the sequencing should be. Is that just a pipe dream or has there actually been substantial debates of that uh, kind, including on issues such as whether an interim government could be part of the path towards a uh, different uh, Afghanistan. So you don't need to take the whole menu, just pick and choose. Yeah. Um, 
I would like to come back to what, what um, Mujib said also. Um, what does the Taliban want to? Uh, do we know? Do we have any precise ID? No, we don't. I, I haven't seen it for a year and a half, but uh, I have never heard him spell out any agenda beyond where we are today, basically. So there I agree completely with, with uh, Mujib. And then I was, I've always been in favor of a peace process. Has that be, been because I believe that the peace process would inevitably lead to peace? No. Uh, but I believe that the peace process will, will make it possible for you to make a judgment. Uh, is the, process, is the peace process, uh, peaceful solution possible or is it not? And I think you, you, you must do that. You know? uh, and I, I, what I really deplore is also that they, from the time when the agreement was made between the US and the Taliban, 29th of February, month after month after month passed. And we all knew that the reduction of US forces was going on. Hmm? Nevertheless, Kabul was stuck in division. Hmm? That, if that time had been used to explore with the Taliban, while there was still a higher number of US forces present, that would certainly have been a great ad advantage compared to where we are now. Now we are um, out of time almost, you know, and that's what ma makes me fearful of where the process will 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 end. Uh, Hasina, um, Kai, you seem to have muted yourself. Kai. Is yeah, it, I am. Yeah. Does it? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know how it happened. Uh, when you're starting well, to address Hasina, that's when we lost you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, then, uh, and, and here, of course, Muji may may um, may uh, um, uh, help me. You know, I I did not know either that the question of which school. Uh, was al already solved, and it, it confirms now that it's not fully solved. But I believe that would be a, a lesser problem than than some other. Um, because I, I I ask myself, you know, will the negotiators encounter problems related to religion in the future uh, uh, that will make it? advantageous for a facilitator with some better knowledge of Islam, you know, um, to be there rather than some uh, Westerner without that kind of knowledge. So that's why I ask, is, is it so that a Muslim facilitator would be a better choice provided that other certain other qualities also exist? I, I, I recognize that I formulated myself much more strongly when I uttered it first uh, during this meeting, but, uh, but then uh, Mujib uh, told us that uh, the most important issue regarding religion seemed to be unsolved, uh, but uh, you may have caught many problems of that nature, even if not that important in the future also. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kai. Uh, we're soon going in for a landing, but I think there's a, there is a question that is, is burning, but which I'd like to invite uh, brief comments upon. That is the regional issue. In one sense, Kai has already offered some of his historical insight when he referred to the fact that uh, his initiatives towards the Taliban were stalemated by the uh, Pakistani arrest of Mullah Bradar back uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, but the observation that I uh, offered, which is that currently we don't really see a regional format in parallel with the peace talks in Doha, seems to be to be a uh, major concern. Uh, others offer their comments on India's position, Pakistan's position. Uh, we have Iran, of course, as a major actor in this, being as much part of a dynamic with the United States of its own as it is part of the... Uh, power dynamics and the shifting security architecture in the, uh, in the Gulf region. So it's a rather complex picture, but what are we to make of the fact that there hasn't been an ability to pull, uh, pull up a uh, regional forum, but we see Khalil Saab commuting uh, 
throughout the one bilateral engagement uh, after the other with, with no ability to really piggyback on all the energy that's been invested in various regional fora throughout the past 20 years. Um, just you... before I get to the just before I get to the regional issue, I wanted to say one thing about the facilitator and how tricky that issue is. Um, if I think Kai remember, we all remember this very well that in when the Doha office was set up, we got so close to a real process when the conditions were much more favorable and the Taliban demands were much less around 2012, 13, right? And mm. that was screwed up by an issue of protocol, largely because there was, a, there was a player in the middle, the Qataris. So the issue there was that the Taliban will open this office, but they will not raise the flag, that they will not be a, an embassy of a parallel government. And the, the Karzai government at that time got that in writing from President Obama, a commitment, that it will just be a political address, that it will not have the symbolism of a parallel government. And yet that still happened. And you had a Qatari assistant secretary, foreign minister or somebody cutting the ribbon on it, right? So, so one of the reasons why we've got uh, sort of suspicion uh, of, of facilitators, of third party players playing a major role in this is that the process is so fragile that any small thing, even out of goodwill, right, could, could break down the process. So, so, so that's the nervousness that there is rooted in history that if, if we had stuck to that process in 2012, 13, the Taliban were in a much weaker place, much weaker place. They couldn't demand what they're demanding right now. Um, on the issue of regional uh, players, that is perhaps where I'm the most pessimistic, uh, if I've been so optimistic so far. Um, <laughs> because, because if we, for a small country, if you look at the multiplicity of players who have a stake, right, in Afghanistan, from Iran to India to Russia to China to Saudi to Pakistan, all those players are kind of playing their own conflicts in Afghanistan. I haven't seen any of those conflicts cool down in any way. I haven't seen any of those tensions cool down to give us some breathing space to solve our issues. Why was there no platform to, to kind of create a regional discussion around it? Well, it goes back to Trump again. There's no way you're gonna get Iran to play a constructive uh, overt role in the process where Pompeo every single day is focused on basically launching a war campaign on Twitter against Iran, right? And same with the tensions with Russia. So if Khalilzad is doing this bilaterally, it's because you've got China and India going at it. You've got India and Pakistan in no better place to sit in the same forum. You've got US very openly talking about wanting a war with Iran. So in that kind of a space, it's difficult to, to get a regional platform going. And maybe there's hope that if Biden resets the deal with Iran, right, rejoins, and that sort of cools some of the tension that we may have some of these players who can rally and kind of become a check on Pakistan. The problem right now is that Pakistan is still the most important player. Pakistan is saying that they have changed their calculation, but the only one who can really tell is the US. And there is no transparency in that process as to what has Pakistan really done to show that they have fundamentally changed their view of how they used Afghanistan, how they've used Taliban. The US says there are signs that they have, but only the US can judge. And having seen the US performance over the past couple of years, that everything is so focused on this one goal of getting out. And that has meant they've turned a blind eye to a lot of things. It is very difficult, again, whether the US is accepting as good enough 
the little that Pakistan is doing on the surface? Or is the US convinced of something more fundamental Pakistan has done to change its calculations of how it views non-state actors in Afghanistan? Thank you so much, Mujib, for uh, filling in for the fact that we don't have a seminar on the region during this Afghanistan week. I think you gave us the uh, core of what that uh, seminar would have been about. Uh, not on an optimistic note, uh, but on a realistic note again. And I think that has been uh, the tone throughout all of this seminar, not any exaggerated optimism, but a very uh, good capture of what it is that we see unfold. Our time has run out and more than that, if anybody's to blame for that, it is uh, me, your share. I have found this extremely informative. I'm happy also to say that for the rest of the week, we will be offering more seminars. And already tomorrow, we are offering a seminar that follows up in depth of one of the discussions that we've had here, namely the role of uh, rights in a political settlement in Afghanistan. Torun Wimpelman, who you met a little earlier uh, as a commentator on this panel, will be moderating that. We have three eminent Afghan experts uh, speaking and we have uh, we have one prepared comment as well and the title of that seminar is islam versus rights question mark the taliban's negotiation agenda for law and justice and that covers anything from the uh, role of uh, the role of uh, islam in the constitution the pot potential role of an islamic supervisory body as well as much more nitty gritty uh, in the legal uh, setup for a future Afghanistan and the discussions surrounding that. With that, I want to thank you. I want to say thank you to our eminent panel. Thank you to uh, Ahmed Jasir Gulami, to Torun Wimpelman for their comments. Thanks a lot to Kai Eide and to Mujib Mashal for their introductions. And knowing that you, Mujib, are on your way to Delhi to uh, become the senior correspondent for South Asia for the New York Times, I also want to use the occasion to thank you for being with us and for the analysis you have provided over the years. And we certainly hope that from Delhi, you will continue to cast an eye towards Afghanistan. And perhaps that would also be a good opportunity to follow up on the topic of a regional concert. Again, thanks a lot. And thank you very much to the audience for your question, your engagement, and for your time. See you tomorrow.